nonetheless, let's give a round of applause. Looking forward to being, uh, but I'm also looking forward to uh, the keynote of uh, David Baker's. With uh, David, we will come back to uh, the topic of uh, our conference. We put into uh, focus uh, ideals and and futures, and uh, our um, um, initial question about the relation of Kirienko, uh, very uh, place <laughs> we are at. Um, David is a, not only a professor for philosophy at uh, Queen's University in Canada, Kingston, Canada, uh, but also the a visiting professor here at the Institute of Education. Um, I will say more to his work, but first of all, I want to draw your attention to a very <clears throat> strange maybe some of you know this very strange artifact in the papers of uh Ilyenko. it is uh, a letter probably never sent to the uh, central committee of the communist party of the soviet union i don't know uh, there's a translation in english of this there it was in Polish. In Polish, uh, and there's also one in german so that's that's why i i, I know no, well, right, okay, we found a translator. <laughs> I get back to you. Okay, but this uh, letter was written at a time when uh, Ilyenkov had a lot of problems again um, in uh, um, the end of the 60s. And in this letter, Ilyenkov was complaining about the state of philosophy or philosophy education in the Soviet Union. Um, the letter is just great, but also totally desperate, of course. Um, and it shows how personal the topic of education and the concept of philosophy, the right understanding of the task of philosophy was uh, to Ilyenko. And the time I was referring to was also the time when a piece in Komsomolskaya Pravda was published, and it's this piece uh, that David will also uh, refer to in his talk. The talk is also part of uh, uh, the book I will then shortly talk about after. Um, what I wanted to add is that uh, the, uh, the problem or the question of education is uh, something which uh, can be traced through the whole work as a central one. But at the other hand, it's also that uh, we get a better understanding in his development. So it becomes more and more topical, let's say while before it was more in the background. We all know uh, David's work from his uh, book, uh, Revolution and Consciousness in Soviet Philosophy of 91. 20 years later, he published a book, The Formation of Reason, which uh, can be seen in is, is only sometimes uh, uh, drawn upon. It can be seen in direct connection with this. Uh, <clears throat> And I think uh, that gives a clear idea of uh, the work of David Beckers. David, I give the word to you. Thank you, uh, Sasha. And first, let me say how great it is to be here and to be here in person uh, among some old friends and hopefully some new ones. So thanks very much indeed to the organizers for inviting me. We'll wait for a long time. This supposed to happen more than two years ago, but uh, here we are now. So. When I began my uh, research on Soviet philosophy now some 40 years ago, I chose to focus on Ilyenkov because of the significance of his role in Soviet thought and because of the intrinsic interest in his ideas. Ilyenkov's monumental significance was made very evident to me during my time in Moscow in the early 1980s. In the years immediately after his untimely death in 1979, his loss was really keenly felt 
by his friends and colleagues. And in my conversations with philosophers such as Felix Mikhailov and uh, Vladislav Lektorsky, his name was always coming up. So it's quite that I should make him the focus of my research. And the outcome of that research, as Sasha mentioned, was Consciousness and Revolution in Soviet Philosophy, which appeared in 1991, shortly before the Soviet Union collapsed. So I, I thought at the time, um, well, Ilyakov is destined to be forgotten. I mean, who in Russia or the West was now going to be drawn to a Soviet Marxist who styles himself a dialectical materialist uh, and a Leninist? So I thought, you know, that's it. This is Kochel's now a work of, of ancient history <laughs> rather than of a living tradition. But in fact, um, interestingly, it didn't wane. In fact, it only intensified. Posthumous editions of his works have steadily appeared since the mid 1980s in Russia. Um, and they get more and more interesting. Um, recently, we have three volumes of archival materials and uh, including formerly unpublished writings, including the letter to the Central Committee, uh, edited by his daughter, Elena Ilish, uh, and colleagues, including Andrei uh, Majdanski, who I think we're hearing from tomorrow, who may be online, I, I, I don't know. Um, uh, Andrei is presently uh, sort of taking a lead in putting together uh, definitive collected works uh, in Russian, which will run to, I think, well, the number of volumes keeps changing, I think, but I, it's going to be 10 or 11 um, volumes, fat volumes, uh, and five of them are already out. Um, and then, of course, there's the annual conference, the Yenkov Senior which is held every spring. And we have a film um, by uh, Alexander Roshkov, the documentary Yenko produced, a wonderful piece of work. And in the West, his articles continue to appear in translation, um, and his work's been taken up in a variety of ways by many people uh, here present. So um, even though in the mid-1990s, I kind of resolved I wasn't going to write about Yenko anymore. <laughs> Uh, I have not been able to keep that resolution because there's always something new and interesting to write about. So I'm, today I'm going to talk about Ilyenkov's views of education. And I chose a topic because it's the theme of uh, my contribution to Sasha's book that he will be uh, launching uh, after I finish. Um, so I thought I'd do a kind of live version of the paper that you can uh, read there. Uh, but the topic of education is a fitting one to address in this institution, um, which is one of the most famous centers of educational research in the world, and one where in the 60s and 70s, um, when Yenkov was writing about education in Moscow, a group of thinkers based at this institute did significant work in philosophy of education. That, strange as it may seem, has certain parallels with the Yankov. And here I'm not thinking about Bernstein, I'm thinking about the so called um, members of the London School, the sort of analytic philosophy of education, Richard Peters and Paul Hurst. Um, uh, method is obviously very different, but there are some parallels. Um, uh, and you know, finally, I chose this topic because uh, I now find myself doing work in philosophy of education and indeed. I'm now the editor of the Journal of Philosophy of Education, uh, which is the journal actually founded from this institute in the 60s. Um, uh, and um, the Journal of the Philosophy of Education Society in Great Britain. So if you have interesting articles in the works on the Yankov and Education, mm -hmm. please send them uh, to us. I'd love to do a special issue on uh, his work subject for refereeing. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, a very interesting society, and um, uh, I, I thank them actually for providing um, some uh, support for me to come to this uh, conference. So, okay, and uh, so Ilyenkov was someone who thought hard about education, 
and who conceived of himself as an educator. Uh, yet that um, is not how he tends to be seen. And his writings on education, many of which are kind of popular and polemical in character, are not particularly well known or much discussed. I think apart from the chapter in Sasha's book, the only paper in English um, is an early, quite brief paper of mine called A Young Goblin Education. Now, that may just be vanity and self aggrandizement, it means I, I don't know <laughs> what else is out there, but I think that's, that's true. Again, with the exception of the work on Mr. Apoc, which you mentioned. Um, uh, but you know, his papers on education are, in, are not just because they contain some nice ideas, but because they cast light on the development of the Yankel sport, as Sasha mentioned. I'm going to say something about them and locate them within his philosophy as a whole. If you're interested in them, many were published in an English translation um, in a special issue of the Journal, Journal of Russian and East European Psychology in 2007. I can give you the reference if you want to hunt that down. Um, so I want to try and show that the concept of education was central to his life and work. And I want to begin by taking you back to Friday, December the 8th, 1967, the day the Beatles released Magical Mystery Tour. I, I, I mentioned that because the Beatles was had an iconic significance, not just everywhere, but in the Soviet Union, everyone, when I lived in the US ago for a year, everyone would talk about the Beatles. Um, so, but the importance of that date is not the release of Magical Mystery Tour, but um, the Komsomolskaya Pravda published the article that Sasha mentioned, the controversial article entitled uh, The Courage of Thought. Uh, and the article was based on a round table that the newspaper had organized um, on the nature and purpose of philosophy. Um, and the article begins by quoting a letter to the editors from a schoolgirl. And um, the schoolgirl writes, Look, if all the laws of being are now known, as all the philosophy textbooks tell us, what use is philosophy? That is Dutch, right? And that question is debated then by Ilyenkov and seven other philosophers, Arsenev, Batyshev, Bibla, Narsky, Mikhailov, Santonova, and uh, Sokolov. So um, that's the piece. Uh, so in the article, it's a newspaper article, so it kind of meanders into weaving quotation and commentary from the two editors, uh, Klankin and Sipko, both of whom became important commentators under Glasnost, um, and the later um, political scientists uh, and theorists. Um, uh, so the question, uh, what it touches on are questions of uh, the nature and extent of young people's interest in philosophy, uh, how philosophy is taught in the USSR, whether philosophy should be approached through its history, whether philosophical ideas should be popularized or not. And the discussion is noteworthy for its very lively and argumentative character. The participants voice disagreement with one another and contradict one another. I mean, you'd expect that, but for those of you who've read textbooks uh, written during the Soviet period, <laughs> They are entirely absent of any such um, dissent or, or um, uh, dialogicality. Um, now you might think, well, no coherent position emerges from this divergence of opinion, except that's what's been artificially imposed by the two editors. Um, but it's important that five of the participants formed a kind of cohort of like minded characters. Um, and here I have in mind Arsenyev, Batyshev, Bibla, and Mikhailov, and Ilyenko. Uh, they were um, they're certainly a like minded group. And, and um, the, the, the four were much influenced, the other four were much influenced by uh, Ilyenko. So it's illuminating to read their respective remarks as kind of uh, contributions to a common position. And if you read it like that, then the following sort of picture starts to emerge. And so here is kind of a synopsis of what I might take from it. So <clears throat> the cultivation of philosophical consciousness is critical to the future of humanity. Soviet citizens, however, can be forgiven for doubting this 
because philosophy in the USSR is so badly taught. Marxist philosophy, indeed philosophy as such, is a unity, but the orthodoxy is to carve it up into dialectical and historical materialism. Students are thus offered two dismembered parts of a living whole. In the first, they get reality without humanity. In the second, humanity without reality. Uh, moreover, uh, philosophy is represented as merely generalizing the results uh, of the other sciences. And so dialectical materialism is reduced to a set of abstract and ultimately vacuous laws that students are told to commit to memory. Um, thus philosophy becomes ossified doctrine rather than spirited thinking. And students pass philosophy courses by cramming rather than by exercising their powers of thought. But this isn't real philosophy, for philosophy is method, not doctrine. Its history is a history of searchings. It makes progress not by deciding in due months and for all, but by raising problems to a new level of understanding. And in that respect, it is just like any of the sciences. These problems reflect its distinctive subject matter. Philosophy is the science of thought. And philosophy doesn't study thought sideways on, as it were, it cultivates critical thinking. As B here's a quote from Bibler, he says, Philosophy begins where stereotypical thinking stops, where critical self-consciousness begins, where the self-evident begins to call for doubt. So the proper study of philosophy exposes students to a treasure trove of ideas in a way that cultivates the power of independent and autonomous thought. And such thinking is essential to human flourishing and a necessary condition for instituting reform and realizing a socialist future. The unity of, the, of philosophy as a discipline, its interest in knowledge as such, antidote to a technocratic cult of narrow specialization. Philosophy reminds us that socialism concerns the all round development of the individual. Its task, therefore, is to cultivate our humanity, to make human beings of us so that we can become authors of our destiny. And the article concludes this is definitely from the editors. Uh, it says, um, a, brain who, a person whose brain is loaded like never before with tons of complex, diverse, and contradictory information needs a profoundly moral, general humanitarian orientation which Marxist philosophy is called upon to give. From it, we draw critical self-consciousness, the demand for truth, the courage of thought. Now, although this summary is obviously a composite, um, uh, and in it, in the text, I sort of note the origin and who kind of said what. Um, um, but all of these ideas can be associated with the Yenkov. Uh, yeah, that's uh, right. We forgot the handout. The handout is notable because it's got this good photo from the, the round table on which the article was based. Um, so that photo is. Um, sometimes reproduced, but the other people are cut out of it, you need to get a picture of the Yenkov. Um, and once you put the others in there, you get a better sense of the mood in the room. <laughs> this isn't a photo of the Yenkov and is most philosophically intense. This is a group of people thinking, geez, the wheels are coming off. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, um, yeah, so all of the views in that little summary can be associated with, with the Yenkov. So the infamous Ilyenkov Karovikov theses, um, theses on the nature of philosophy, and other writings from the early to mid 50s argue for the unity of Marxist philosophy and for the claim that philosophy's true subject matter is thought. Accordingly, Ilyenkov rejects the idea that philosophy's role is to generalize the findings of the other sciences into a worldview, um, articulating the most general laws of nature, society, and thought. Philosophy practiced that way just produces backwards generalizations, supposedly universal truths that are at best common sense or platitudes and at worst empty nonsense. So Ilyenkov's reverence for the history of philosophy and his recognition that philosophical progress consists in the insights gleaned through the dialectical transformation of its problems is evident in many of his writings in the 1960s, particularly his doctoral dissertation, parts of which will be published in uh, Dialectical Logic. And finally, the cultivation of critical thinking as a power of self-determination is a theme 
uh, the book of idols and ideals, a book that Yenkov was finishing at the time of this round table. Um, and also in that book, this philosopher's responsibility to uphold humanistic ideals in the face of positivistic technocratic conceptions that were gathering momentum in Soviet culture in the mid 1960s. Now, the humanistic character, if you want to call it that, of this position was very much in harmony with the spirit of the times um, in Eastern Europe. That the Prague Spring, with its advocacy of socialism with the human face, was in the making at the time. Uh, the Komsomol Skyafalda article was published. And as a result of this resonance with the spirit of reform, um, the disputatious character of the discussion and the open criticism of the teaching of philosophy in the Soviet Union, um, there was an angry response from the philosophical establishment, uh, I think foreseen in the expressions and so <laughs> at the table. Um, and many of the participants suffered as a result. Worst affected were Mikhailov and Ars Arsenyev. Um, but he and Ilyenkov emerged from this relatively unscathed, um, though his and Batisha's participation did not go unremarked um, at the Institute of Philosophy. And the incident contributed to his denigration and persecution later as a revisionist. <laughs> so um, the Komsomolska article illuminates the importance of. Uh, education for Yankov and some of his like minded colleagues, and the reaction it provoked reveals just how much was at stake in the debate. Now, at the dawn of 1968, Yankov saw the purpose of Marxist philosophy and the communist project as such as the flourishing, not of class or party, but of real human individuals engaged together in autonomous critical activity. Socialism must create the conditions in which truly self-determining activity becomes possible and possible for all. And since such activity is the mark of the human, or the human being, as it were, then socialism creates the conditions in which we can become human. Philosophy there has, therefore has a vital educative and moral role in engendering critical self-consciousness and in addressing the forms of alienation that stifle and distort it. Of course, this responsibility lies not just with philosophy. The entire education system must be harnessed to cultivate and sustain powers of critical thought central to the nature and possibility of human flourishing. Yeah? And this theme figures um, often implicitly, I have to say, um, but it figures in many of the Yankov's writings devoted specifically to questions of education. So, I mean, I said, uh, let me have a quick drink. So I said that these ideas were sort of quintessential in Yankov. I mean, it's interesting though that um, they weren't all as, as, uh, as prominent in his work. So from the outset, his work exemplifies critical self-consciousness, but it doesn't explicitly theorize it, uh, at least in relation to the individual. Um, although Yankov portrays philosophy as a science thinking, his early writings treat thought quite impersonally. It's not a psychological inquiry, it's a logical inquiry. Philosophy concerns the norms of thinking, how we ought to think, not how particular people happen to think. And of course, Elyenkov does not treat logic, as he would put it, as a purely formal discipline. This is a logic of content that unifies epistemology, um, understood as the theory of inquiry or the science or scientific method, um, and dialectics, the theory of thought's movement towards insight, truth, and self-understanding. So the reality of human thinking has to be in view. The Yankov's emphasis is on thought as a socio-historical reality, not on individual minds. Um, that's also true of his work on Marx's method. Uh, I think the subject of his candidate's dissertation and of his first book, um, eventually published in 1960, after much meddling, as mentioned earlier, uh, as a dialectic of the abstract and the concrete in Marxist capital. So here, Ilyenkov developed a critique of positivism and empiricism, which represents scientific thinking, um, or, uh, I mean, Ilyenkov's critique represents scientific thinking 
as exemplified by Marx's, Mar Marx's capital as a movement, not from the apprehension of concrete particulars to the articulation of general laws, but from schematic and partial representations of the object of inquiry to an understanding of the object as a developing unity and diversity, an understanding that articulates why the object necessarily takes the form it does. Again, the topic is not how scientists do think, but how they must think. And the treatment of thought is largely impersonal and anti-psychologistic in the Yenkov's um, book. Um, that's also true of the uh, very early work, The Cosmology of Spirit, in which there's now a lot of, surprisingly, not, well, not surprisingly, but, but um, uh, if you'd asked me 30 years ago whether people be interested in the cosmology of spirit, I, I would have been surprised. I mean, it was unpublished in his lifetime, and given the heretical nature of its content, it's extremely unlikely that it was written for publication. I can just put it in a, in a drawer uh, where it's saved. Um, uh, this uh, philosophico poetic phantasmagoria, I think that's the actual subtitle of the piece, um, essentially denies Soviet Marxism's principle number one, the primacy of matter over spirit, asserting that just as there is no thought without matter, there is no matter without thought, and arguing in the best traditions of Russian cosmism that thought's destiny is to create conditions to overcome the thermal death of the universe. How? by developing the technology that will enable human beings or their successors at some distant point in the future when the universe is cooling to the degree that it will soon be unable to sustain thinking life, to engineer a new big bang, thereby sacrificing themselves, but launching the universe on a new phase of development that will in turn eventually create new thinking beings who will at some distant point in the future sacrifice themselves to relaunch the universe and so on. Um, this work is a kind of homage to thought, but again, thought is treated personally as a property of the material universe and not the individual. But things begin to change, I think, with um, the famous uh, 1962 article on the ideal. In that text, Ilyenkov explores how materialist is to understand the nature of non-material phenomena and their place in objective reality. And the orthodoxy amongst Soviet philosophers was to naturalize the ideal in a kind of two-step process. Um, you first identify the ideal with the mental, and then you reduce the mental to brain functioning. The ideal was thereby construed as a subjective reality, which, though emerging from and dependent upon material processes, was ultimately confined to the human skull. Yankov takes a rather different approach. He rejects the putative deduction of the ideal to the mental and argues that some ideal phenomena exist objectively. Artifacts, for example, have an ideal quality because they are embodiments of purpose. You couldn't understand the properties of an artifact merely in terms of its physical constitution. You have to grasp its function and use. And similarly, economic value is treated by Marx as a real property of certain material entities understood as an objectification of human labor rather than a projection of merely subjective mental states. Marx's appeal to labor, Ilyenkov argues, is the key to understanding the ideal, enabling us to see that objectively existing ideality is not a, a cult or supernatural phenomenon, rather a source right in human agency, which becomes objectified in the form it imposes on material reality. So Yankov argues that each human child is born into surroundings structured by objective ideality, which reside in the activity of the community and in the form the world or the environment takes on as a result of that activity. So notwithstanding the preoccupations of empiricists, philosophy and psychology, human individuals do not have to create a conception of the world from scratch. On the contrary, Human children inherit forms of thinking and reasoning as they are initiated into humanity's spiritual culture, as Ilyenkov says, internalizing the community's practices, including its language practices, and learning to negotiate the ideal forms that define their world. And it, it is in this process that children 
acquire their conceptual resources of constitutive of powers of mind. So on Eyankov's view, the nature and possibility of individual human life is explained by appeal to the nature and possibility of the ideal and not the other way around. So with this, the individual kind of enters Eyankov's philosophy. Admittedly, in this point, the individual mind is represented as a vehicle of culture. Uh, cultures conceived as kind of a living embodiment of human mindedness. The individual is seen not quite as a product of culture, but as its agent. So Yankov writes, famous quote, the subject of thought becomes the individual in the nexus of social relations, the socially defined individual whose every form of life activity is given not by nature, but by history, by the process of the formation of human culture. But now the space kind of opened up for a theory of building or a theory of personal formation. And soon Yankov tend to focus more and more on thinking individuals, on the circumstances of their formation and their education. So what accounts for this change of emphasis, if you like? Um, it's not, of course, that Yankov suddenly discovered the individual. I mean, we all along, uh, as Marx and Engels point out in the open to German ideology, the first premise of all human history is, of course, the existence of real living human individuals. But gradually, he kind of comes to see, I think, um, uh, that the, he came to see, and maybe he had he gained the confidence to maintain that. Um, that's not just the first premise, it's also kind of a last premise. Um, socialism's aim is to create the conditions for human flourishing. The only flourishing that matters in itself is the flourishing of human individuals. So when he returned from the liberation of Berlin in 1945, Ilyenkov saw the Soviet project in kind of world historical terms, in the cosmic terms. Um, and he continued to think that way in the immediately post Stalin era. But I think the failings of de Stalinization put things in a slightly different light. The dispute over the theses was a battle for hearts and minds between the old guard of the Soviet philosophical establishment and a younger generation who sought to create a culture of critical, independent thinking. Yankov soon realized that although history had to be on its side, it wasn't obvious that it actually was. Um, I mean, notwithstanding de Stalinization, all the members of the philosophical old guard retain their positions of power. And with various adaptations to credo and vocabulary, continued on just as they were. And this made it clear that uh, people <laughs> were an obstacle <laughs> um, to change for the better. <laughs> And that this obstacle could be overcome only by other people willing and able to do things differently. And Yankov was certainly prepared to step up and be one of those other people. And that sort of fortified him in his mission to uphold philosophy understood as this recreated self critical thought in search of truth, understanding, and self understanding. And it also gave him a reason to gradually come to focus more and more on individual minds. Um, and of course, whether um, in the party, in academia, or in society at large, reform presupposed a culture of self-critical independent thought, and that demanded the right kind of mass education. And so in 1964, Yankov starts writing pieces on education, targeting a wide audience. And the message of these papers is captured in their titles, which became Yankovian slogans almost. Learn to think while you are young, the title of one. And schools must teach how to think. These have exclamation marks, these <laughs> both titles. Um, another important reason for this sort of turn to the individual, if I can put it like that, um, was his involvement in uh, Alexander Nesherokov's work with blind, deaf individuals, uh, which began in 1967. So Nesherokov had had incredible success, particularly with four blind deaf students who were successfully completing secondary education and about to enter Moscow University. Uh, Ilyenkov was fascinated by this, uh, seeing the Shirokov work as illuminating the social preconditions of mind. So 
part of his interest was kind of theoretical. I think when he was drawn um, to into that sort of circle, um, but this made questions of individual formation very real for the emperor. Um, but more than that, I think he, he came to care deeply about the Shurikov students, whom he befriended and he mentored. Um, and this intensified his conviction that socialism was to be measured by its power to enable the flourishing of all individuals, however disadvantaged they might be. Um, and I think a further contributing factor was the growing influence in the 60s of the concept of the scientific uh, technological revolution. Um, this concerned speculation about the potential advances in computing, information technology, and robotics, and their power to rapidly transform social economic life. Such issues, of course, are kind of back with us, <laughs> um, with a lot of the, the attention to innovations in automation and, and AI and, and so on. So this is very familiar stuff, but an earlier period where all of these kinds of issues were top front and center, the mid 60s, and not just in Eastern Europe, um, in Britain too, we put Harold Wilson and what the white heat of technology and all of that rhetoric. This is, this is big, but it has particular resonance in, um, in Russia because of the significance of plan, the planned economy. Right? So the thought was, we can fix the, the rationality of the planned economy through cybernetics and system theory and so on, right? So, and as today, the reaction is divided between sort of heady optimists <laughs> and uh, gloomy pessimists. Um, and um, the optimists, they saw the scientific technological revolution is transforming the forces of production in a way that would enable the communist future. Innovation was going to increase productivity, create wealth and abundance. It would automate would free workers from monotonous, dangerous, and otherwise unpleasant jobs. It would create leisure time on an unprecedented scale. Um, cybernetics was going to wipe out the notorious efficiencies of the planned economies and um, would enable the flow of information which market economies somehow managed to, to do that spontaneously. Um, and it would eliminate the human factor, by which they meant error and corruption. And say it like that, but that's what they meant. Uh, in middle management and bureaucracy. Um, uh, but they also thought that this was going to sweep away, you know, the, the real the radical reformists thought this was going to sweep away ossified Marxist feminist dogma and stimulate the renewal of um, socialist theory too. Um, I mean, some of them presumably thought it would be better if socialist theory went away to serve the rest of it. But they were sort of, pro it's not that this was a kind of, um, it's not that among the, the advocates of the scientific technological revolution, its effects were, just double dyed reactionaries. There were some who hoped for renewal of those in, in, in the uh, in socialist intellectual life. So, Elienkov is a pessimist on this. Of course, he claims, I don't have anything against cybernetics as such, um, or against liberating workers from meaningless labor. Um, but he dislikes the idolatry of technology, which he thinks has a long history in Soviet Marxism, uh, notoriously in the work of philosophers of uh, the work of Lenin's uh, rival, uh, Alexander Bogdanov. So Ilyenkov fears the dehumanization of economic life. The technophiles fantasize about the Soviet economy as a self-organizing machine, but we know what a self-organizing machine, the economic machine looks like, it's capitalism. Um, <laughs> it's not the machine or its efficiency that's at issue. It's what the machine is for that's important. We should never lose sight of the fact that machines are artifacts created to fulfill specific ends. So the rampant specula speculation about the creation of machines more intelligent than human beings rests on a mistake. Of course, machines can often do tasks better than human beings. That's why we invent them. But so what? Butterflies can navigate long distances much better than uneducated human beings. But that doesn't make them more intelligent. Human-mindedness, Yankov thinks, is universal in character. 
our minds can hold the world in view as a totality. We can commune with the infinite, the ideal. We can contemplate the possible, the unreal. And this is manifest not just in our heads, but in our form of life, in our life activity, played out in the world in historical reality. So thinking is thus qualitatively different in character from a machine function. And so philosophers who reduce thinking to brain functioning simply fail to understand what thinking is. If we portray human beings as machines, then we have to ask, what are human beings for? Because the question, what's it for, is a question you can always ask of a machine. But that question shouldn't be answered because it shouldn't be put. Indeed, socialism with a human face is the rejection of that question. Rather, the question we should be asking is the Socratic one. Who should we be? And an answer to that question presupposes that we understand what a non-alienated mode of life is like, and we can attain that only by focusing on the character of real human lives. Elenkov attacks the pretension that alienation is impossible under socialism, as Rodney will discuss tomorrow, I think. Um, and he argues that faith in the scientific technological revolution only promises to make things worse. And such themes run through many of his writings in the mid 60s. Um, and they help, these various factors help uh, explain the shift, I think, in Lenkov's perspective, leading him to speak not just in general philosophical terms about the cultural formation of the human subject, but to consider more concrete questions of the upbringing of human children. So in the chapter, uh, in Sasha's book, I dwell on a number of specific themes in Yankov's writings on education. So one is his radical anti-nativism about the human mind, the view that, uh, here's a quote, all the specifically human forms of mind are determined socially and not biologically by innate structures of the brain and body um, of the individual member of the species homo sapiens. So the social constitution of mind is one. The theme is a familiar Elinkovian uh, view, and he makes much of it in educational context, arguing that um, notions of natural ability or the lack of it just provide educators with a sense of excuse uh, to cover up the ineptitude of their teaching methods. I mean, that's why they just naturally weren't up to it. I'm sorry, didn't understand. Um, so that's one theme. And another theme is the influence of his work of, on the abstract and concrete um, on his friend and colleague, Vasily Davidov. Uh, and his theories of educational uh, psychology, um, which are also much influenced by Vygotsky. Um, and the Vigos critique of abstract thinking, which has resonated with Vygotsky and Stanley and Davido were very close uh, friends. Um, so I talk about that, but I'm not going to talk about those in the interest of time, but you can read about it. That's one of the particular reasons. <laughs> get the book uh, or um, uh, download it. Um, I'm just going to focus on one particular issue, which brings Ilyenkov into dialogue with the thinkers who were from the Institute at, at the time he was working. And this is um, the theme about learning to think. So for Ilyenkov, Human beings are self-creating animals defined neither by God nor by nature, but by their own powers of self-determination and self-transformation. Elenkov's distinctive way of combining his conception of the social formation of mind with a commitment to the cultivation of autonomy or the power of self-determination is expressed in, a, in this theme that runs throughout his educational writings, learning to think. Um, and Elenkov portrays the power of thought as a social gift not just because the child acquires it through initiation into culture, but because she learns to exercise it in consort with others. So he is interested in the teaching relation. Now, the concept of thinking is a normative notion. It contains within itself, as it were, a standard of excellence. To understand the concept is to know what it is to think well or poorly. What, then, does excellence in thinking amount to? So for Yankov, a good thinker is resolute in her intellectual commitment, but she's never dogmatic. Just here I'm distilling from the, 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 the writings. Uh, 
Good thinker has a skeptical disposition, not in the sense that she questions the question of safe, but because she's open to entertaining well-motivated doubts about her beliefs, however entrenched those beliefs might be. A good thinker has a range of intellectual virtues. That's not a term we yet often use, but it's a term that's currently fashionable in educational philosophy. These are, she's imaginative, she sees problems, and she finds creative solutions. She's a good listener and a thoughtful interpreter who finds sympathetic readings of text or utterances. She's an able communicator who makes her thinking transparent to others. And such intellectual virtues, Ilyenkov thinks, can't be codified into a set of rules or principles. A talented thinker has good judgment. She's able carefully to discern the factors relevant to belief or action in the case at hand, to weigh them up judiciously and to come to a decision about what to think or do. And such discernment is akin to perception, to seeing what matters and how it matters. It's not a question of following procedure. Now, the non viability of good judgment leads some philosophers of education to wonder whether it even makes sense to speak of teaching. But Ilyenkov argues that we can cultivate good judgment, not by giving students abstract rules and principles, but by putting them in situations in which the objective character of the problem they confront calls forth a solution from them. Only then can they appreciate the principle that grounds their solution and internalize it as a guide to living. If you start by giving them rules, then that's just another object that they've got to deal with, and a lifeless one at that. Because here, Ilyenko and Wittgenstein, the rare occasion where Ilyenko and Wittgenstein are on the same page, um, the rule cannot contain the conditions of its application. You have to see how the rule is to be applied in particular cases. So, relevant to this, now it sounds, sounds like I'm describing Ilyenko in non Wittgenstein terms, but here's a, here's a bit of. Uh, Ilyenkoviana, as it were. So here, the dialectical character of inquiry is critical. Dialectics is the theory of the movement of thought through the contradiction. And Ilyenkov, in a way which kind of reminiscent of Dewey and the empiric uh, and the pragmatists, represents all thinking as stimulated by contradiction. To acquire the culture of thinking means, therefore, he writes, to learn to bear the burden of contradiction. So thinking critically requires an ability not just to respond to contradictions when they present themselves, but to find them, seek them out, um, find those that might otherwise go unrecognized and address them with imagination and creativity. And again, there's no recipe for this. But you can teach students not to fear contradiction, but to be, but to, to, to go looking for it. And this requires they develop the kind of skeptical temperament that Yenko affords. Moreover, you can guide students in the diagnosis and transcendence of contradiction in a way that fosters the intellectual virtues, curiosity, imagination, and so on, described above. Um, and by putting them into situations that engender critical and creative thinking, and by giving them confidence to think for themselves. Uh, and all that has implications, I think, for you know, the curriculum design, the ethos of the classroom, um, which ought to value and reward creativity and imagination and talent and encourage students to challenge received wisdom and see the world anew. I mean, these are messages that resonate with educators today. Three minutes? Three minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, actually, no, that's good, because I'm almost finished. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so these papers on, it, on uh, education, they look like slight occasional essays written for lay audiences for top of popular material that maybe we can just kind of ignore. But if you put them in historical context, they help bring out the humanism that inspires in English philosophical vision and that becomes increasingly explicit, I think, in his work in the 1960s. And they also help us understand the tragedies of Lienkov's final years, I think, because it should ought to be obvious why Lienkov and his allies welcomed and even identified with the Prague Spring and why they were horrified by the Soviet invasion. Of Czechoslovakia in August 1968. I don't think Ilyenkov 
lack of morale ever recovered from that disappointment. Um, because I think, in a sense, the narrative of the Russian Revolution was now broken before him. Um, I mean, that narrative sort of went um, uh, as, I mean, as long, I mean, Stalinism was aberration and we're on a path of post-Stalin reform. And when the tanks went into Czechoslovakia, I think that just put paid for that way of seeing what was going on. It shook his faith in the possibility of reform. Uh, and I mean, as Sasha mentioned, Ilyenkov was prone to write letters to the Central Committee, to this one to Shadanov, I think, that this is one to Mikoyan. Um, because, and the belief there is that um, those in real power include people who are on the side of him. They're just ignorant of the damage done and the injustices perpetrated by, by the sort of middle tier of bureaucrats and managers. After 1968, he no longer writes. I, and I think there's a sense in which he kind of lost hope. The young Ilyenkov could endure endless tribulation because he believed. Um, but now, without hope, he didn't have a psychological defense against persecution, and persecution was not far away. By the end of 1968, his humanistic philosophy, so in tune with the spirit of the times uh, a year ago, it was quickly losing currency. He was protected by successive directors of the Institute of Philosophy, Pavel Kotnin and then Bonaparte Kedrov. But when Kedrov was succeeded by E.S. Ukrainsev in 1974, Ilyenkov was helpless. Ukrainsev and his sidekick, ex KGB operative Elena Modrozinskaya, who Lektorsky blames for Kotnin's death and Kedrov's resignation. Set, I mean, Kotnin died by natural causes, but he was much stressed by the circumstances of the institute. Um, they, and Elena Modrinskaya, I know I'm going over my three minutes, but not by much. Uh, Elena Modrinskaya, interestingly, was a KGB operative who's been sort of put out to pasture, and they, they would put KGB operatives and such like out to pasture in institutes of philosophy. <laughs> it didn't have any philosophical background, as far as I know, but so, um, actually, she's interesting because she had the file of the Cambridge spies. Um, so she's pretty good as a KGB operative, I imagine. But um, basically, she set out to make um, take every opportunity to frustrate and demean Kuyenko. And the last straw was the protracted controversy over the publication of his long essay, The Dialectics of the Ideal. Um, which was eventually published in its definitive form in Logos and translated by Alex Levant in the Dialectics of the Ideal book uh, in the HN series. Um, but I mean, that led Ukrainsov to assert that as long as he was director of the Institute of Philosophy in Moscow, not one word of Ilyenkov's would appear in any publication that was controlled by the Institute. And to silence Ilyenkov, the, the, the signif rhetorical significance of silencing Ilyenkov on that topic, right, on the topic of the ideal, where he was um, a renowned authority who rejuvenated Soviet philosophy through the publication of that early 1960s article, that was a, a huge significance. And I think it was more than Ilyenkov could bear. So, the last thing I'm going to say is that in the face of the Soviet Union and in the present state of Russia and in the behavior of its leadership, Ilyenkov would find no consolation whatsoever. But I like to think he would take heart from this conference. It's been said that a further disappointment Ilyenkov endured at the end of his life was that he felt abandoned by his friends, um, such as Vasilyev, Arsenyev, and Bibler, whose respective philosophies had moved away from. Uh, Ilyenkov's. I think it was unbeatable, I think, to think he was abandoned, but it was, to go back to the theme earlier, that, that philosophy, a lot of philosophy was done in the kitchen, in informal discussions, and when people's views sort of went in different directions, it was harder to, you know, to have that intense philosophical debate uh, at home around the kitchen table. And so I think he felt a little bit abandoned, but I think you'd be glad to know that his work continues to inspire and that he has plenty of friends and members of this organization who find inspiration in his life, his work, and in that which he defended 
embodied and celebrated, namely the courage of thought. Thank you. Thank you, David. We will, we will have a little bit of philosophy around the table quite soon. Um, we're going to first take about 10 minutes of questions. Uh, and then we have um, quick presentations about books that are um, coming out. But um, it would be great to take a few um, questions. Um, I'm not sure why I'm still using it. Quick question about Czechoslovakia in 68. Uh, if 68 was this big moral blow to the Yankov and <clears throat> us in the generation, maybe, that the Soviet project was dead. Why didn't that happen in 56? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, was, was, maybe this, was that too close to Stalin period? Uh, I mean, that may, that may be the answer, but um, I mean, I should say that um, I mean, this isn't um, a kind of original interpretation. I'm not trying to say, okay, now here's my hypothesis. Um, in this, I'm following um, not just um, discussions with um, conversations. I mean, a lot of my early work in Moscow was uh, conducted around kitchen tables. Uh, I, had a, I had a recording Walkman. <laughs> you know what? I mean, if people are old, if you're old enough know what that, that is. I had a sort of, it was just super high tech at the time. I'd just record these conversations people, with people's permission. I mean, uh, people. Um, and so, um, so I had a lot of, sort of conversational data. Um, but it's, um, Lekovsky writes about the, the Prague Spring um, uh, as a significant factor in uh, breaking the hearts of that generation, and, and in particular, Ilyenko. Um, and um, I think there's a, I, I mean, if I had to speculate, well, you've asked me to speculate, so I'll speculate. I mean, I think the um, I, the ethos of socialism with a human face, I think, um, really resonated with that generation. Um, they felt that, you know, this wasn't a question of unity, the question of unity within the Soviet bloc. This was a question that, that, that was about the ethos of socialism. And I think that, and they saw you know, they thought maybe there are arguments to be had <laughs> about the way forward, uh, but they're not to be settled by, by just forcing conformity through military action. I think that was the thing that... Yeah, I mean, yes, and, and I mean, the details of how, I mean, it's, it's really interesting that, you know, there was not, not just a lack of communication with Western thinkers, but there was, um, there were not very transparent relations between Eastern European <laughs> philosophers either. Sometimes they were, you know, the, the Czech philosophers were viewed with, with as much suspicion as a poor suspicion than people remote, because you could write off, you know, French Marxists as, oh, well, they don't, they're over there. And, but the ones in Allah, through the Allied countries were particularly dangerous, just as Ilyenko uh, as, was considered subversive. Because he was right there challenging orthodoxy all the time. Um, and so, anyway, I think the philosophical ethos is important in the Prague Spring. Um, and that's what distinguishes it from, from Hungary in 56. Um, we'll, we'll go to Rodney and Yanis and then over Pete so we can uh, raise some others. Uh, Rodney. 
Hi, David. So that Hi, was. How are you? Hi, fine. Yeah, I'm a little bit sleepy. I have to wake up today, like <laughs> 4 a.m. to watch. <laughs> but yeah, it was amazing. Um, so I really enjoyed your talk, especially especially the part of the critique to cybernetics and you know the idea of the machine. Uh, that topic is, uh, I think, it, it will be. Uh, in the near future, uh, the main point of attention for many people. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to hear, I, I read here in the in the chat, that it's going to be translated, or it's going to appear in in the book that is uh, it's going to be commented uh, right away. So I, I'm looking forward uh, for that. So one question. So you mentioned it, uh, about the... Um, the attitude that Ilyenkov suggested a student must have regarding contradiction. Um, so uh, a question that I have, especially after reading your book on Ilyenkov, is uh, what is your opinion regarding the ontological status of a <laughs> a contradiction because that's such a polemic um, topic and I know that you have discussions uh, about this so that's what I asked sorry <laughs> um, yeah so Rodney um, Rodney is uh, a doctoral student at Queen's University which is where I teach so um, I know him very well um, and uh, uh, he knows this is a, a sore spot. So in my 1991 book, uh, in the chapter on dialectics of abstract and concrete, I say, um, about the one critical thing I say about the Inkoff is that thinking of objective contradictions as part of actually constituents of reality is a mistake. Um, and, um, and so Rodney's saying, do you still stand by that? And I mean, I don't think his views of education hang on that particularly, because I think he's, what you're de dealing with, of course, is um, thought. <laughs> you're in the domain of thought, you're dealing with the student, and you want them to address um, contradictions. I mean, those contradictions have to be real in some sense because you don't just want you know, it wouldn't be useful to give students a bunch of contradictory propositions and say hey you know sort out uh sort this out but what you so the contradiction has to be um sort of pedagogically or um intellectually challenging in the situation so i mean that you know you can cast so that's the question about so what's the difference between the Prague Spring and Hungary in 1960, or the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 68 and Hungary in 56? That's a, you can cast that as a, a contradiction, but, uh, and of course, what do we get by thinking of such contradictions as real? Well, um, uh, that there's something that kind of forces you to into a situation where you 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 can't just drop one side. So that that it's like a the contradiction is such that um, it's not easily resolved because you take one side, then suddenly the alternative gets back into view and, uh, and so on. But that's a very different question from whether material nature, as it were. So if we're in the realm of the ideal and objective contradiction, okay, I can buy that. But in a full-blown Engelsian dialectics of nature, which wrongly is an expert on, actually, he's far more expert than I am. Um, uh, I can't. I find I'm not sure whether I can even understand what what's what's meant. But maybe that's just my renegade bourgeois. Use of, of the nature of science and matter and such. And Yanis, um, final question. To uh, hello, David. Uh, congratulations, amazing uh, speech. Um, 
One uh, question. Um, you argue also in your uh, notes that you, you sent us that Ilyankov, since uh, uh, until the 60s, his, his focus mainly on the thought from an impersonal perspective. While uh, after 62 and especially after 64, he has an, a kind of orientation towards the study of intersubjectivity, education, and so on. Uh, you think this kind of orientation that uh, Ilyankov um, follows after 62, 64, towards intersubjectivity would have changed his comprehension and his conception about the ascent from the abstract to the concrete, the way he understands capital, which is a work that uh, he has done till the 60s, but has not yet developed this kind of approach. That's my question. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, I don't think it does. So, you know, my, my view is that this, this, the notion of individual formation becomes a topic of deep importance for him in the way that it isn't in the earlier works. Um, uh, but I don't think he thinks of that as um, in tension with his conception of, of with his logic, with his di uh, dialectical logic and with with the application of dialogical logic to the analysis of scientific thinking. He's perfectly happy um, to see his views of the abstract and the concrete uh, developed into a theory of learning by the Vidov. It's not that, I mean, and Yankov was, I mean, it was really interesting to hear uh, Isabel earlier talking about, you know, this early paper as being in tension with some of the later views, because Ilyenkov, Ilyenkov sort of philosopher certainly changes his mind very much, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so it's natural for, for people trying to make sense of his work to think of it as um, kind of a single position that gets articulated, but doesn't involve retractions or, um, I mean, it's not, he's not that kind of philosopher. He's a philosopher who, um, who in some ways sticks to his guns and so variations in his work are not clear, certainly not advertised by him. Um, and so I don't, I don't, my position is not that he's interested in the individual meant that he thought you should no longer have a science of thought or anything like that. Um, it's just that the sort of the whole range of questions come into view for him. Um, that you can, you know, you could argue against this. You could say, well, look, in Dialectics of the Abstract and the Concrete, there is a little section on activity and so on in one of the chapters where you can kind of see the social formation of mind flagged. And also that late paper on uh, what is the person, um, that has a very sort of abstract conception of, you know, the, the, the social essence of, of I mean, there's there's less in there as I remember it about individual formation, and we're back to a kind of strong view about um, uh, the human essence being the ensemble of social relations. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. It's a long time since I read that. I would um, on that late paper that there is a I don't know if you know this. Um, there is a dialogue that. Um, I gave a seminar, I mean, 1983, on that late paper, and Mikhailov, Leptorsky, Fiedler, and um, Davidov all gave long responses. And the, so that's a record of then in action, uh, because I, it's transcribed and translated, it appeared in 1995 in the Journal of in Studies in East European Thought. And you can, you can see from that, actually, a lot of discourse about psychological relevance of Yankov's views. Um, uh, and, but also you can see the kind of humanity with which these guys engage with philosophical topics. And it's a paper, it's very long and nobody uh, reads it. So I, it's a shout out <laughs> for that. Um, uh, 
but uh, in response to your question, I don't see it as a as a sort of fundamental change in this perspective, but an enrichment of, of it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got some exciting things to uh, talk about. I'm going to um, pass over for a minute to Bear Gaversky. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I only speak for one minute. I'm new to this uh, society and I'm very delighted to be here. I met already some wonderful people and also old colleague of mine from Japan right here, <laughs> Professor Yamazumi. So it's such a nice surprise. And I'm also delighted to meet you, David, in person. Uh, Alex Levat, uh, the lead editor of the book called uh, Activity Theory, an introduction, is coming out next next year, and I'm one of the co-editors, and I thought I would come here to speak about this, and I hope that you will uh, buy or <laughs> ask your library to, to purchase. <laughs> so thank you for this. And, oh, the uh, post today. Yes, there's a poster. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Well, you know these posters. While Sasha's doing that, I hope someone in the room will um, buy his equals book because otherwise I have to go on eBay. I just I I, I only bought them for the convenience and also the people want to engage with the presentation. Um I mean uh you, for those of you who are uh, more inspired perhaps by um, CTPO's presentation, um, the look of all these schemes, I think, for how it brings together, it, I, I think you think it uh, brings the discussion of nationalism and dialect extremely well um, and brings body positivity into the new concrete of dialect. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Uh, quite fittingly, uh, this announcement for, for the new book. I also look forward to have a look in it. And I think uh, activity theory is a uh, very important uh, topic to explore. Um, I wanted to uh, give a presentation on the book, which I was working on, um, I mean, on and off, of course. Uh, for for quite a time now, as uh, those who uh, were involved from the start, as you know, David and uh, Noel. Um, so um, since we don't have that much time, I will cut the long story short. Uh, <laughs> Whoever agrees on that. Um, so if uh, anybody wants to know how you uh, begin with uh, publishing a book on Ilyankov, then. Um, do a book series on political epistemology with the university press and ending up as being kind of a publishing house yourself, you can ask me. <laughs> I skip this. Okay. With all technicalities involved. So just that you uh, see what is the problem uh, or what is the reason why the book is now not here. The book is uh, kind of finished. It will be the third. Uh, Volume of, uh, of this book series called Verum Factum Studies and Sources on Political Epistemology. And the first book is uh, this, uh, the lost textbook, also very important in my opinion. Uh, a lost textbook by Boris Gessen, um, an attempt of a historical materialist textbook. Quite, quite interesting, but we can talk about this later. I skip also uh, any introductions. About this, uh, the volumes uh, which are uh, new are also uh, the Vient Architecte Italian Radical Science um, attempt. Uh, the subtitle is Scientific Paradigms of Historical Materialism Translation. Uh, and Ilyakov, as you see, will be the third one. I skip the Jesse part now and come to our volume. This is how it may look like.
like, I had have a little bit of problem of finding the right uh, uh, cover in the trajectory, <laughs> but we are still working on this. Something like this. So this will be, this is a collective volume uh, containing translated text by Yankov. I will uh, point them out uh, in a minute. Commentaries on the text and articles, essays, uh, also the article of uh, David, uh, Isabel's and Trevor's commentary, uh, we already mentioned today, an interview with Elena Marie, uh, done by Bessa Oitinen, and an appendix of letters, uh, interesting maybe in terms of the uh, um, time of uh, the review of the young uh, Hegel, and uh, because it was done with the East German friend of Yankov, and uh, the appendix would contain the letters between them. Uh, the, the, actually, the assistant of Long in light. So that's that's quite interesting how they it takes you back there. Um, yeah, so this is how it uh, should look like. I give an introduction. Um, Siad Shazeri uh, is uh, kind of doing the parallel work to, to David's uh, article in uh, um, Russian philosophy um, volume of uh, Bikova and Yudkovsky. Um, second one, uh, it's, it's somehow chronological in, in this uh, First part text and commentaries uh, is the mentioned article Dialectics of the Abstract and Concrete and Scientific Thought, where I think is really uh, we get a sense of what the, the book uh, of Yudyankov uh, would have looked like uh, if it was not had any sense. Um, yeah, of course, the cosmology of the spirit had to be in there, although it's already published in Stasis uh, 2017. Uh, I mean, I wrote a commentary myself, and also Giuliano wrote a commentary uh, in Stasis, so we are trying to kind of combine ours. Yes, and then very importantly, I think, and uh, thanks to IFI, we had a lot of uh, to, to the international friends of Ilyenko, we had a lot of uh, discussions about the text, also of, also about the translation of the famous uh, encyclopedia entry of 62. The idea, I have to say, is really important, also historically, as, um, like uh, as uh, David also mentioned, the, the ideal this this uh, that that it was possible that an entry. Uh, like this uh, was published in the Philosophic Encyclopedia, like in a pub, in an in a, in a official uh, kind of, of, of uh, textbook like thing was for many people in uh, the Eastern Bloc states quite, not, not only in the Soviet Union, that's what I want to find out. Uh, Yankov was in the Eastern Bloc known because of that. And um, yeah, then uh, Marx and the Western World, I, this has already uh, been published uh, in English because it was a uh, thing from a conference. Yenenko uh, was invited to receive it here. He was not allowed to go. Um, uh, Andrei Majdanski is uh, commenting on this in terms of Yelenkov's. Uh, I already hinted at this at um, Michael's uh, talk uh, that Majdanski al also had this uh, idea that Yelenkov uh, was really thinking about uh, uh, the state uh, and, and, and socialism in, in terms of, of the development of. Um, the possibilities for actually the withering away of, of the state, uh, in the sense uh, Andre is uh, commenting there. And uh, what Rodney asked in, in the chat was uh, this uh, actually, and it's not an essay, it's more like a tale. And that's, that's what I always you know, found so astonishing. It's from the uh, Idols and Ideals book, which was a kind of top, uh, attempt of uh, Ilyenkov to convince the broader 
audience uh, that fetishizing uh, cybernetics and technology is, uh, so to say, yeah, the wrong way to go because uh, it will only lead uh, to the condition we have today that, that we see social progress only in, in technological progress, actually. But the point of, of this tale is, of course, that uh, the machines cannot think. And I, I rather not go into that. It's a, a very nice commentary by Katie Schucho. Maybe, she, maybe she's also here. Ah, Julie, uh, translated her. She's just coming in. Hi, Julia, I just uh, talked about your translations. And he also translated uh, what is personality, so to say, a piece of uh, 1977, which I commented on. Not is actually the word that Yankov uses for describing as a metaphor of the, uh, what Marx otherwise calls the uh, uh, ensemble of, of social media. Yes, and uh, I won't go through all of uh, the uh, things, just point out um, that uh, this whole endeavor was really based on enthusiasm. So when this is out, I will be very proud because it's really like producing something out of thin air, except for the, <laughs> it's like alchemism, so to say, yeah? because uh, except for some translation we have no at all. Um, yes, um, the thing, as you see, is, is uh, ready. Uh, it will be available probably by the end of the month online. And then as a book on demand, you can have it also in book form for its production price. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks. Uh, just, just one last sentence. I, I really want to thank everybody who's, who was uh, part of it. Also, Corinna was for, for some time um, because everybody really put work into it and without knowing what comes out of it, really. And so it's really work of enthusiasm. And I also want to point out that Alexander Suvorov has a piece in there, which is rare. Uh, for those who know who he is, he was one of the left line students who did his object in psychology. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, we will be any second now walking to Coptic Street uh, to Peter Express. Um, hopefully, as many of these possibly can join us for the meal, then I'm sure we'll informally uh, go to near pub, a nearby pub after like. The college arms. Uh, try not to leave too much time to give uh, Camina's extra work. Um, if you do want a uh, copy of this, it's 30 pounds, which is cheaper than the price in the back. Well, thank you very much. I just want to say about the meal because quite a few of you thank you very much for only paying your 20 pounds. Um, the way it's going to work is that if you, if you haven't been able to transfer 20 pounds into the account that was sent, you can buy that. Well, I've got a little screen that could we not make it too late because some of us have long distances to get home at the end of it. And I've got to wait till you all finish before I pay any yeah, I'm like, 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 I
Make sure you've read the papers. Yeah. 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 Yeah.